Boredom. I'm bored. You're bored. We're all bored. It's the postmodern condition. People complain of, be of being bored all the time. People do not want to be bored. People think that being bored is a bad thing. Today I'm going to discuss how boredom is actually the meaning of life. And if you want to make your life, to render your life meaningful, you should seek boredom. You should aspire to boredom. And you should make boredom your main task and goal in life. This calls for a little mental acrobatics, a little intellectual pyrotechnics, and a lot of rethinking boredom and reframing it. Now, those of you who are adept in philosophy will recognize echoes of Nietzsche, of Heidegger, of others. I'm not going to mention names in this video. I'm just going to recommend to you two books. One is titled Boredom Studies Reader, Frameworks and Perspectives. It was um, edited by Michael Gardiner and Julian Jason Halladine, or Halladin, H-A-L-A-D-Y-N. It's published in 2017 by Rutledge. And the other book I recommend is Experience Without Qualities, Boredom and Modernity by Elizabeth Goodstein. There are other very good books about boredom. And you can find a list of relevant authors in the first book, The Boredom Studies Reader, which, is, which comes highly recommended. Boredom is the meaning of an authentic life. It's the meaning of an authentic life. We are bored when we are hyper-stimulated. When we are overstimulated, we become bored. Consider the following. You watch an amazing blockbuster action film. You are excited. You're thrilled. You undergo a unique experience. You forget about your boredom. Actually, technically, psychologically, you dissociate. Now then you watch another action film and another action film and another 20 action films. By the 21st film, you will find your mind wandering away. You will find yourself being bored. So boredom is another name for overstimulation. But what is overstimulation? It's when you're exposed to life. Life provides you with stimuli, provides you with input, life throws information at you. And the more information it, th it throws at you, the more you shut it off. Studied have concluded that we ignore, repress, deny, shut off, fend off, firewall, 95% of all the information we are exposed to. We pay attention to only 5%. And even these 5% are processed via mathematical models in the brain, so even they don't represent reality. We are terrified of the information glut. Our brain is inundated, it's drowning, it's swamped. And one of the main protections it has is boredom. Boredom is a direct exposure to life. It's when you are exposed to life without any mediation, without any firewall. And consequently, you're flooded with signals, with symbols, with information, with data. And of course, the more you're exposed to life in this way, the more, the more dysfunctional your filters are, the more you are swamped and drown in and a tsunami of, of uh, bits and pieces, things that 
require your attention one way or another, the, the more desensitized you become. It's a little like addiction. When, when you start drinking alcohol, one glass is enough. And then one glass does nothing for you. So you progress to two glasses. And then two glasses don't, don't do it. So you end up drinking whole bottles in order to secure the same reaction that you used to have with a single glass. It's the same with overstimulation, with exposure to life. If you allow yourself to be exposed to life as it is directly, you become desensitized. You need more and more of life just to feel alive, just to feel excited, just to feel reactive, just to feel in existence, just to experience your being. Life desensitizes you. And your, your relationship with life is an addiction. Ultimately, you tune life out. Attunement. You, developed a you develop a mechanism to keep life away. Because it's, it's too much. And you require bigger and bigger dollops. And, and finally, you're overwhelmed. Boredom is a defense against being overwhelmed, but it's a defense that indicates that you are in touch with life. If you are bored, it means you are being exposed to life without censorship, without filtration, without defenses. It means you are in direct contact with life. It means there's no skin between you and life. There's no partition, there's no firewall, nothing separates you from life. And this, of course, creates overstimulation. So boredom is a wonderful indicator that you are actually finally in touch with reality, in touch with the world, in touch with life itself. Boredom is an indicator of an authentic life, a life that is not falsified not um, shadow banned, not censored, not filtered, not trimmed, not reframed, not lied about, not falsified, not fake, real life, raw life, strong life. So when you get in touch with life this way, without anything separating you from it, you become bored because boredom is the only defense. But boredom, therefore, is a great indicator of mental health, actually. It means you're still capable of experiencing life and your own existence and being firsthand. Yes, you're swamped. Yes, you're overwhelmed. Yes, you're inundated. Yes, you're drowning. Yes, you're terrified. You have angst. Yes, you're anxious, maybe even depressed. But these are good things. These are not bad things because they lead you to boredom. And boredom tells you you're still alive in an authentic, in a correct way. You're still in, di you're still in direct contact with life. But this raises the question, why should direct contact in life not result in joy? Why direct contact in life doesn't bring you happiness? Why is boredom the mood that invariably results when you interact with life directly, not via intermediaries, not via gatekeepers, not even via your unconscious and other defenses, not via your psychology? Why, whenever you get in touch with life itself, Whenever you become one with life in a way, whenever the interface between you and life, you and reality, you and the world, this interface is so thin, it cannot no longer be discerned. It's like you have lost your skin, dysregulated. You become dysregulated by life itself. Why then don't you react with enormous joy, with unbridled happiness? Why do you react with boredom? 
Because life is nothing. Life is empty. Life is an emptiness. Not in the bad sense. Not in the pathological, psychopathological sense. But emptiness in the sense that it's a huge nothingness. And it's not even huge because it has no dimensions. It's just not being. Not there. So the minute you get in touch with this nothingness, you react with nothingness. When you experience nothingness, we call it boredom. The minute you get in touch with the universe, with the world, with reality, with creation, if you're a, a, a person of faith, whenever you truly get integrated, whenever nothing separates you from your inner world and, and the outer world, that minute you have touched upon nothingness and you have a nothingness reaction which we call boredom but therefore boredom is a form of being it's the extreme the most radical the most pure the most unadulterated form of self-awareness introspection and observation it is becoming aware of the self itself as nothing. Becoming aware of how your nothingness resonates with the nothingness out there. Becoming aware that nothingness is the principle of what we call life. That moment you become bored. Now don't confuse boredom with ennui. Don't confuse boredom with worthlessness. Don't confuse boredom with anything else. Such confusion has been rampant throughout the annals of philosophy and psychology. These are mistakes. It has been noted that boredom is often confused with anhedonia, inability to find pleasure with anything, with depression. <laughs> boredom is not depression. It's not anhedonia. How do I know? Because depression leads you to inaction. When you're depressed, you cannot act. You do not wish to act. You wish just to sleep. You wish just to remain inert. You, you, don't, wish to, you don't want to move. You don't want to talk to anyone. You don't want to do anything. Boredom is exactly the opposite. Boredom motivates you to act. Boredom pushes you to act. Boredom is the principle of life. And it manifests through life. Now, the problem of Western civilization is that it had developed an extreme intolerance of nothingness. We reject all manifestations and proofs and evidence of nothingness. We reject death because deep inside, we know that afterlife is nonsense for, for infantile people. We know that death is nothingness. We know that boredom is when we touch upon nothingness. It's a reaction to nothingness. And in this sense, it's the meaning of life. Because what is the meaning of life? It's to touch upon nothingness, to reach the core, to reach the cornerstone, to reach the foundation, to touch authenticity, to touch re the real, to touch the, un the uncontaminated, the unblemished, the unadulterated, the pure, and that is nothingness. So when you touch upon it, you become bored. You have a boredom reaction. And that's the meaning of life. The meaning of life is to become bored by touching upon nothingness. And Western civilization cannot tolerate or contemplate this because it has an enormous intolerance for nothingness. Now, it's the only civilization in human history if we consider the Roman Empire to be part of Western civilization, it's the only civilization in human history which had developed an intolerance for nothingness. All other civilizations had adopted nothingness as a founding principle of their ethics, philosophy, uh, the good life, the principles of the good life, etc., etc. Nothingness is the founding principle of most other philosophical systems. Only in Western civilization we are so childish 
so infantile, so immature, so narcissistic, that we reject life itself. And what is at the core of life, this diamond, the diamond of life, the harsh yet brilliant, um, cutting yet sparkling core of life, nothingness, and the mood that it evokes via attunement. We get attuned to nothingness and we react with boredom and Western civilization cannot countenance it. Cannot countenance it. So Western civilization had developed four defenses against boredom. The unconscious. Things that are too painful, too real, too overpowering, too, too, too much to contemplate. We repress, we deny, we bury. And we call this the unconscious. So the unconscious is a defense against touching, reaching out with a finger and touching the core of life, like in the Sistine Chapel. You know, the unconscious protects us from realizing what's really happening, who we really are, and how our essence, our quiddity, which is nothing, nothingness, can resonate and interact with the nothingness out there. And so we, we, we fend off, we, we defend against, and no wonder Freud called it defense mechanisms. These are defenses, we def but you defend against something. What are you defending against? Reality, the truth, the core, the pure, the real. That's what you're defending against. Another way of coping with, with boredom, fantasy, including religion, of course. All forms of fantasy are defenses against the nothingness and the meaninglessness of life and the world. The meaninglessness and nothingness which we reify, which we are, because we are part of the world. This Cartesian division, we and the world, we and nature, we as observers and the observed universe, this is idiotic. It's counterfactual. It's also seriously stupid. We are an integral part of everything and everything is an integral part of us not in the classical eastern mystical sense in the physical sense that's physics what i just said so we we develop fantasies including religion to somehow convince ourselves that there is that not, there's no nothingness of course it's a self-defeating statement because it's a negative statement. It's, it's, it's a statement about the, non, the nothingness of nothingness. And then we come up with God and, and uh, other sets of symbols, like the nation state, or whatever, your football club. And these are fantasies. And the third way we cope with boredom is mastery. We try to master the world. We try to control the world. And we do this via action. We act in the world and we act upon the world. And as long as we are busy, keeping us busy, acting, we forget that we are bored, we suppress it, we repress it. It's still there. It's still there because it's the only way to get in touch with what is echt, what is real. But action is a good way to camouflage boredom and nothingness, to disguise it's a society of the spectacle. It's make-believe. And so we act. We are addicted to acting. We can't sit one minute. We can't contemplate anything for longer than 15 seconds. We have to act. We have to drink something. We have to surf somewhere. We have to watch something. We have to, we have to act. Because the alternative to acting is dread. Dread, angst, Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard's dread, um, and, and Sartre's dread. We, we can't tolerate this dread, the dread of 
existence and being as nothingness. And so we pretend that we actually can imbue nothingness with somethingness. That's called creativity. And we pretend that we can control nothingness, harness it, like put the genie back in the bottle, look away. So this is action. So it's the third solution against boredom. Solution number one, the unconscious. Solution number two, fantasy, including religion. Solution number three, mastery, action. And solution number four, which is becoming more and more predominant, is diversion or entertainment. We distract ourselves, we divert our attention, we entertain ourselves. And here is the core problem. Here is why all these four strategies are self-defeating and will never ever work, which is the, the root of the existential crisis that we had found ourselves in. Here's what they, why these solutions are never going to work. And here's another bit of fleshing news. There are no other solutions. Now, these solutions are not going to work because, remember, boredom is a reaction to overstimulation. When life gets in touch with you, demolishes your defenses, um, and floods you with information about nothingness, in effect, when you're exposed to this plethora and panoply and tsunami and avalanche and tidal wave of life itself, you react with boredom. This boredom is the mood which allows attunement. Boredom is the way to access unhindered, in a direct, unmediated way, the core of life, the identity of life, what life is, its essence, its quiddity, the primal, primordial, substance of nothingness that it is made of. So the process is overstimulation with signals, with symbols, with stimuli. Boredom, that's a sequence. But what is entertainment and diversion? Overstimulation. What is action? Overstimulation. What is fantasy? Overstimulation. What is religion? Overstimulation. What is the unconscious, according to Freud at least, overstimulation? He said that the unconscious is a repository, a reservoir of, of pent-up energy, which is released in therapy in a process called abreaction. It's overstimulation, but buried, buried overstimulation. They're all overstimulation. The four solutions we had found to cope with boredom, to mitigate boredom, to ameliorate boredom, they lead to even more to an increased level of hyper overstimulation and therefore to even more boredom. But there's a difference between someone who says, I'm going to get in touch with life. I'm going to extend my finger and I'm going to touch life. And consequently, because it's nothingness, I'm going to be bored and I'm going to accept my boredom. I'm going to accept my boredom and welcome my boredom. Because it is my boredom that will lead me to life, connect me to life, and ultimately make me alive. That's the healthy version. And the, that's the authentic life. And the bad faith life, the life that is inauthentic, fake, fraudulent life, that's a life that says, I'm going to reject boredom. I'm not going to accept it. I'm going to reject it. And I'm going to fight it. And I'm going to use these four strategies to fight it. The unconscious, fantasy, mastery, action, diversion. I'm going to use these to fight off boredom. And of course, it's not going to work because it it's just increases boredom. You're exposed to even more stimulation and you become bored even more. So, not only these are dysfunctional strategies, they drive you away, away from life. They are what Baudrillard called simulacrum. They drive you away from life into a simulated reality where you don't need to be bored, 
Why you are not bored in that simulated reality? <laughs> because it's not real, of course. It's not life. But life intrudes, and the minute it does, your boredom skyrockets. These solutions are temporary. These solutions are ephemeral. These solutions are dysfunctional. These solutions enhance boredom. They don't reduce it, and they enhance the wrong kind of boredom. The wrong kind of boredom. The kind of boredom that pushes you to employ these four strategies, to deploy them even more. In other words, addictive boredom. The boredom I'm talking about is existential boredom, profound boredom. That's the boredom you should pursue. The minute you become profoundly, existentially bored, you will suddenly see the light. You will suddenly know exactly who you are, are, in the sense of being, like Heidegger's design, who, who you are. And by knowing who you are, because you are an integral part of life, you will know what life is. And that is the fount, that is the source of enlightenment. Again, not in the mystical sense, it's just this over prevailing, prevalent certainty, prevalent sense of calm restored. You will suddenly not feel the need to act, not feel the need to pursue, not feel the need to fantasize and to deny, and not feel the need to do all these things. You will just be at peace with yourself and with the world, because you will have realized via your profound boredom, you will have realized that there's nothing there and there's nothing here and you're okay with it. It's no problem. There's no problem because there's nothing, including problem. There's nothing and it's fine. It's fine. It's not threatening. Nothingness is not threatening as, as any cursory glance at, at philosophy will tell you. On the very contrary, Nothingness motivates, nothingness enriches life, nothingness causes you to, to imbue everything with the meaning, and the meaning is the meaning of nothingness, but it's still meaning, and it's absolute. Perhaps that's what religious people call God, I'm not sure, although, of course, I don't think they'll be happy to describe God as nothingness, although there are indications in the Bible that the perception of God was as a kind of nothingness. Moses and the burning bush, when God refused to materialize, you know, he just said, you know, the, the, the sound, the, the voice is me. I'm, I'm nothing. I'm nothingness. And the problem is that we have these four defenses against profound existential boredom, and we convert the boredom into addictive boredom, because we need more and more of these defenses. And we confuse these defenses with meaning. We don't understand that to fantasize cannot be meaningful by definition. Nothing can be meaningful if it's divorced from reality. Reality is everything. Meaning cannot exist outside reality or contra to reality. So fantasy can never be meaningful. Action can never be meaningful. Diversions and entertainments can never be meaningful. To confuse these defenses with meaning just leads to an infinite regression to nesting. Because, you know, who says that the book I had just written is meaningful? Other people say so. But how do they know? Where do they derive their sense of meaning from? How can they judge if something is meaningful? And then I have to accept their definition of meaning and, and they derive their sense of meaning from other people. And there's no end to this. It's infinite regression. Action can never lead to meaning. I repeat this. Action can never lead to meaning. Resistance is futile. Confusing these defenses, strategies of coping with boredom, confusing them with meaning, is a meaningless exercise. The only meaning, the only meaningful, authentic life is boredom. Boredom, if it is really profound, if it's existential, if you are not afraid of it, 
if you let it happen and consume you and you you go down deeper and deeper into what others tell you is Hades but actually it's paradise and you let yourself go and you say I'm not terrified I'm not afraid nothing's going to happen to me except good things you go through this gate you pass this gate and there's authentic life meaning meaningful life at the other end because you will have established direct contact with nothingness as a form of being as a form of self-awareness and we in western civilization we use these four defenses and when these defenses fail we are bored it's addictive boredom it's a kind of boredom that requires you to do even more you know um, you want to be entertained you want to be distracted you have to do more and more you want to fantasize you have to fantasize more and more it's diminishing returns and so when these defenses fail we are bored we are bored but you should wish for these defenses to fail and you should wish for them to fail dismally irrevocably powerfully because when they fail when all of them fail when you're no longer fantasizing you're no longer religious you're no longer a man of action or a woman of action. You, you're no, lo you no longer deny what it is that you see. When you, when you surrender, when you surrender to nothingness as a principle of reality, at that point, you have reached healing. You have reached a healthy, a healthy, meaningful, authentic state. And ironically, at that point, at that point, you are suddenly capable of action. You are even at that point capable of, of fantasy. You are capable of enlightenment. You're capable of anything. It is then that you become capable of anything, but in a healthy way, from a position of strength, from a position of resilience from a position of assuredness, of calm, of peace. It's not stayed, it's not stale, it's not inert, it's not dead. It's a maximum alive. It's exact opposite of death. It's maximally, to be maximally alive. To be maximally alive from nothingness. When you emerge from nothingness, when you break out of nothingness, you break the shackles of fantasy and action, and when you break out of nothingness, you are beholden to no one. You owe nothing to, to nothing. You are not imprisoned by expectations, demands, mores, accomplishments, the past, the future, narratives, defenses, Mental illnesses, personality disorders are a form of narrative. I mean, you are, you're free, you're truly, utterly liberated. What is the source, the only source of strength? Liberation, freedom. Strength is the, strength is the, is the way people experience freedom. Resilience is their ability to continue to experience freedom unimpeded by society by others by institutions and so on and so forth not the malicious kind of freedom not the freedom to destroy not even the freedom to create these are fantasies the freedom to be the freedom to exist and if your existence implies action you act and if it doesn't you don't and if your existence requires fantasy you fantasize and if it doesn't, you don't. You have the choice. You have the option. Option. Choice. These are synonyms of freedom. You have the freedom. And this is the sense. This is what it means to be enlightened. Enlightenment is not about knowledge. That's a Western concept. Enlightenment is about the assuredness of being existence as guaranteed knowing that you know without knowing 
acting because you can, not because you have to. So when the defenses fail and we become profoundly and existentially bored, that's actually a healthy state, a healthy state. We should seek boredom. We should aspire to boredom because it is the only way, the only path, the only Tao to the enlightenment of nothingness.